this presentation tonight is is one that I um, uh, th that's based on an article that I wrote for Sport Aviation uh, that uh, was published in the May publication and uh, uh, the, the concept here is that we're going to be exploring the concept of uh, redundancy um, in, uh, in aviation. Um, the, the, it, we have a lot of redundancy built into our airplanes because the general notion is that the best way to protect against the failure of some critical component is to have two of them. Uh, and so, for example, we have uh, uh, typically two magnetos on on uh, each of our engines. We have two spark plugs in every cylinder. Uh, most of the most of my 45 years of flying, I had a dual uh, navcoms on the panel. Now I have a dual uh, GPS navigators. Um, some of our airplanes, including the one that I fly. Uh, uh, have two engines, uh, which is uh, why I maximized my carbon footprint coming back from uh, AirVenture back home to California. Uh, two engines are kind of a little bit painful in a in a an, an age of seven dollar avgas, uh, uh, and and we're going to be talking about uh, a fuel efficiency one of my upcoming um, uh, upcoming uh, webinars. But at any rate, the 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 general uh, concept is that uh, the best way to protect against failure of a critical component, uh, whether it uh, whether it be a, a magneto or or a, a a piece of avionics or an engine, is to have two of them. Um, and my purpose tonight is to explore that uh, concept of redundancy and uh, show that there are. Uh, some uh, some fallacies in the redundancy concept and, and some things that every pilot and aircraft owner need to be aware of with respect to redundancy. So let's let's start off with one of the most obvious uh, areas where uh, where we have redundancy in our, our aircraft, and that's the ignition system. Uh, the FAA requires that uh, all certificated spark ignition reciprocating aircraft engines, which are the kind that most of us fly behind, have fully redundant dual ignition systems. And the reason that the FAA requires this is that ignition failures are fairly common. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about ex just how common and how they fail. Um, and uh, the failure of an ignition system can affect safety of flight. It's something that can cause you to fall out of the sky. So because it's it the failures are common and because the uh, failures are safety critical the FAA requires uh, that we have dual ignition systems in our engines in fact uh, here is the the actual regulation uh, FAR 33.37 says each spark ignition engine must have a dual ignition system with at least two spark plugs for each cylinder and two separate electric circuits with separate sources of electrical energy. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what kind of uh, ignition failures we have uh, because they come in various flavors. Uh, some are not particularly serious, some can be very serious. Uh, the most common kinds of ignition system failures that we have by far are spark plug failures, whether the spark plug becomes fouled uh, with a contaminant, uh, uh, lead fouling or oil fouling or carbon fouling uh, or whether the spark plug actually has a structural failure like the like the cracking of the nose core insulator. Um, in general spark plug failures uh, they're very common we see them all the time but in general because we have dual ign ignition systems uh, spark plug failures are usually benign. In fact um, unless you have an engine monitor installed, uh, it's very likely that if a spark plug fails during a flight, you won't even notice it because the engine keeps on running. There are no um, signs of failure uh, because the affected cylinder uh, has another spark plug firing. If you do have an engine monitor, you will notice the spark plug failure because the EGT on that uh, affected cylinder will rise. 
Um, and uh, that's you know one of many reasons that 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 I strongly recommend that uh, that uh, every uh, every pilot who flies behind uh, a, a a piston engine uh, have an a, a, a an engine monitor installed so that he can detect these sorts of failures. Um, but frequently, um, if an engine monitor isn't installed or if the pilot isn't real savvy about interpreting it, the failure of a spark plug won't be noticed until the beginning of the next flight when you do a, a pre-flight run-up. And in fact, if the uh, spark plug failure is uh, is not an outright failure, but just a marginal uh, condition, uh, which we we see quite frequently, um, the uh, the failure of the spark plug might not even be noticed uh, during the next run up because the uh, the pre flight uh, mag check is really a very crude check of the ignition system and it doesn't put the ignition system under very much stress. So marginal uh, ignition problems usually don't even show up during the pre-flight run-up and might not be discovered until the next annual inspection. Um, so let's talk about another kind of failure, and that is magneto failures. Uh, magneto failures can be very serious or not so serious, depending on the way the magneto fails. Uh, the best kind, ironically, the, the, the best kind of magneto failure is a complete magneto failure where the magneto just quits cold uh, because let's say the the points fail or the condenser fails or something like that and stops the magneto from file it firing completely and the reason that that that's the best kind of magneto failure to happen if you will is because uh, the complete failure of a magneto um, it's basically like switching the uh, the ignition switch from both to left or from both to right, and uh, uh, we know what happens when you do that. The the, the engine keeps running, uh, all of the EGTs rise if you're looking at them, uh, but the airplane doesn't fall out of the sky. It loses a little bit of power, but unless you're paying attention, you probably won't even notice. Uh, and again, uh, the failure of a magneto might very well not even become apparent um, until the the uh, the next flight when you do your pre-flight run-up and discover when you switch the ignition switch to one setting or another the engine quits. Um, uh, but you know that's kind of the beauty of having a redundant uh, uh, ignition system. However, there's another kind of magneto failure, one that we see distressingly often. Um, that is a much more serious failure, and that's when the magneto doesn't quit, but it has a failure that causes it to fire the spark plugs at the wrong time. And when that happens, uh, w things can get pretty ser serious. Uh, I talked about this condition uh, in uh, a webinar I did some time ago that's on the EAA uh, video server uh, about magnetos. Um, so these pictures might possibly look familiar to you, but this is uh, these are some pictures of some magneto distributor gears uh, that exhibit the kind of failure I'm talking about. These are plastic gears, and um, the failure mode is that some of the teeth wind up breaking off. And when the uh, teeth start breaking off the uh, the distributor gear, here's kind of a close up of one of those, so you can see it. Um, as you can imagine, the distributor stops rotating in in in, in proper synchronism with the engine, and uh, and starts uh, sending sparks to random cylinders at random times. And when it does that, um, all hell can break loose with the engine. The engine can run extremely rough. Uh, there can be a, a pre-ignition events that 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 can potentially do serious harm to the engine. Um, uh, but uh, in, in general, the engine will will feel like it's uh, like it's coming unglued, and it's it's quite a, a, a scary event when it happens. Um, now, here's the interesting thing: um, during a two-year period, um, we in, in the in the a fleet of about 300 uh, piston-powered GA airplanes that my company manages. 
Uh, we're now managing a lot more than that, but during this two-year period, we were managing about an average of 300 uh, uh, airplanes, and um, we had six of these magneto distributor gear failures um, during a two-year period uh, in these 300 piston airplanes. So doing a little quick arithmetic, that's one failure per year per 100 airplanes. Now, you can, you can interpret that in several ways. You could say, well, uh, that means I could go 100 years without having a failure like this. Um, but on the other hand, it also means that, that out of 100 airplanes, uh, one is going to exhibit a failure like this every year. To me, that's kind of a, a scary um, failure rate for a failure that is, uh, is very, very serious. Now, in theory, this shouldn't be that big a deal because we have a redundant ignition system. And so uh, when, if, if a magneto goes berserk and starts causing the engine to go berserk, uh, all that really has to be done is to identify which magneto it is and, and shut it off with the uh, ignition switch. Um, but here, here's the thing. These six failures that, that occurred in our group of 300 roughly 300 airplanes over a two-year period, uh, happened to all sorts of pilots, ranging from, from uh, uh, very low-time uh, private pilots to highly experienced CFIs with thousands of hours. And they also occurred in all phases of flight, uh, in, varying from uh, pattern altitude to, uh, to one, uh, one failure that actually happened to a turbocharged uh, Cirrus that was flying at flight level 210. Um, uh, up over uh, up over Ohio, and the interesting thing is that uh, not one of these pilots, not even the experienced CFIs, had the presence of mind to identify and shut off the misfiring magneto. Every one of them treated it as a catastrophic engine problem, declared an emergency, and treated it as an emergency. Uh, where really had had they identified the bad mag and turned it off, uh, it wouldn't have been an emergency. The engine would have run just fine on the remaining magneto, and they could have continued the flight to to their uh, intended destination. In fact, even the failure that occurred at flight level two one zero, where the uh, the pilot literally had nearly a half hour uh, as that airplane descended into Cincinnati Lunkin Airport uh, under an emergency declaration. Uh, he had a half an hour to, to, uh, to think about this and to troubleshoot the problem, and it did not occur to him uh, to, to, to try the left mag and the right mag and figure out which one was working and which one wasn't and, and, and shut it off. So, you know, it's, they, they had redundancy in the system, but they didn't use it. And, and clearly, we have some sort of a pilot education problem here. We need to add this to our checklists, or we need to remember that it's on our checklist uh, in, in the case of, a, of an engine problem. Um, because the redundancy did not do these pilots any good unless they knew how to make use of it. So there's a lesson to be learned there. Um, Let's talk about a particular kind of mag. Um, this, the title of this slide is One and a Half Mags Enough. Is uh, I, I stole shamelessly from a uh, blog post that Mac McClellan made uh, some time back in his, in his wonderful left seat EAA blog uh, that he does every week, um, where he was talking about the, the, the Bendix uh, D2000, D3000 dual magneto. Uh, that is fitted to a lot of Lycoming engines. It's only used on Lycomings. If your Lycoming has a D at the end of its uh, of its designation, that means that you have a dual mag installed on it. Um, the dual mag uh, is uh, is essentially two magnetos packaged into a single case and uh, driven by a single drive shaft. Uh, and it was developed um, uh, at the request of Lycoming uh, so that they could uh, reduce the amount of real estate needed in the uh, in the accessory 
a case of, of the engine and uh, and they could eliminate uh, some of the uh, internal gearing uh, in in the accessory por portion of the engine um, but basically it's two mags you can see that in the picture packaged into a single case uh, with a single drive shaft that is driving both mags uh, the, the mags each have indis independent distributors independent uh, rotating magnet assemblies independent points um, they're driven off of a single cam, uh, but basically uh, th there's almost complete redundancy here, or it, it's almost the same as two separate mags, but almost isn't quite enough. <laughs> uh, th this this mag, th there's some question about whether it should really have been certified. It does meet the letter of the FARs, as as I as I read earlier. But it doesn't quite provide the same de degree of redundancy as two separate mags. Uh, and in particular, there are two common mode failures. Uh, common mode failure is a failure that takes out uh, or interferes with both mags at once. And clearly, uh, if a system has a common mode failure, uh, that really uh, defeats, at least in part, the redundancy that we're looking for. The most common <laughs> common mode failure with the dual mags uh, involve the clamps that uh, that clamp the mag to the to the back of the engine to the accessory case, and we find that um, quite frequently those clamps are not being properly torqued, and they wind up uh, coming loose. Um, and that allows the the, the the dual mag to rotate uh, on its mount. And uh, and screws up the timing of both mags at the same time because of the fact that there's that there's just a, a single drive shaft and this thing mounts to the to the engine with a single set of clamps. Now with conventional mags, it's possible for the clamps to come loose, but if they do, only one mag is affected. Uh, with the dual mag, if the clamps come loose, uh, both mags are affected exactly the same. And um, if the uh, if the mag slips in the advanced timing direction, it can be very destructive to the engine. If it slips in the retard direction, it's a little less violent, but it it can cause a, a loss of power. Um, but this is a common mode failure that uh, that affects these mags uh, and defeats uh, and is not resolved by by redundancy because it, the the failure affects both uh, both of the mags at once. An another uh, common mode failure that we see occasionally is a failure of the impulse coupling uh, which is uh, which actually couples the the mags drive shaft to the engine. There's only one impulse coupling uh, on a uh, on a uh, uh, one of these dual mags uh, as opposed to separate ones for each mag, which is what we have when we use two conventional mags. So if the impulse coupling fails, um, it affects uh, both mags at once if you have one of these uh, D3000 mags installed. And again, um, you, you, you lose the benefit of the redundancy. So the, the dual mags, which are installed on a lot of Lycoming engines, provide a significant amount of redundancy, but not as much as two separate mags would, and I'm not, you know, there there are a lot of people who are very uncomfortable with these dual mags. Uh, when Mac posted his blog post, there were a bunch of flight instructors that got on and told horror stories that they had with with uh, with Lycoming powered airplanes that involved these dual mags. One of them went so far as to say he won't fly an airplane that's equipped with a a dual mag. I think that's a little extreme. But it is important to understand that if you have one of these installed on your Lycoming engine, you aren't getting quite as much ignition system redundancy um, as you would if you had two uh, conventional mags. Uh, even with two conventional mags, there are cases where common mode failures can take them both out. One of them that I've uh, seen a couple of times in aircraft that are under our management have to do with with pressurized mags uh, th that are used on turbocharged airplanes that fly up at the flight levels. Um, 
we manage a lot of twin Cessnas that, that have uh, these pressurized bags. We manage a very large number of turbocharged Cirruses that have uh, uh, pressurized mags. And every pressurized mag in, uh, installation that I have ever seen, whether it's a twin Cessna or whether it's a Cirrus, um, use a single um, air line uh, and a single air filter to provide pressurization mag, uh, air to both of the mags. Uh, to me, this is this is crazy because it creates a single point failure that that can take out both mags, uh, or common mode failure, if you will, that can take out a single failure can take out both mags, and uh, uh, something that I've now seen twice in the last few years is a situation where the the little plastic nipple on the uh, on the pressurization air filter uh, breaks off because of vibration and uh, if that happens when the airplane is flying up at the flight levels both mags instantly depressurize and go crazy <laughs> and um, uh, in each case the, the the pilot had to declare an emergency uh, descend to a lower altitude um, where the pressurization wasn't necessary and in both cases when he got on the ground there was damage uh, to both magnetos caused by internal cross-firing, which is the, the the problem that the whole pressurization system is designed to uh, uh, to prevent. It's called high altitude misfire. But the idea of of having two magnetos and then uh, pressurizing them with a single line and a single filter strikes me as being a very poor idea. But every installation that I've ever seen does it that way. Uh, I don't know why. If if I were uh, an aircraft designer rather than a mechanic, I certainly wouldn't design the system with a single point failure like that. Um, let's switch to a couple of other uh, redundant uh, su subjects of redundancy other than the ignition system. Um, talk a little bit about dry air pumps that are used in, in, uh, in many airplanes to provide vacuum or pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to, to drive uh, uh, um, air-driven uh, gyro instruments. Um, the air pumps can are, can also be used for other things like inflating the icing boots and so on. Um, the nowadays we use these dry air pumps that 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 have carbon vanes inside um, and uh, uh, a, a graphite hub with graphite vanes running inside of a, a, a an elongated. Um, uh, steel cavity. Um, uh, these pumps were introduced uh, about roughly 1970. Prior to that, we used what are called wet pumps uh, that used steel veins and required lubrication. Um, the, the, one of the problems with the wet pumps was that the uh, uh, the 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 air that they ejected had an oil mist in them because the pumps had to be lubricated with oil. And so the, that that uh, air had to then go through an oil separator, and, and and it was a little bit complicated. But the the wet pumps had a very very benign failure mode in that they gradually wore out, and gradually started producing less vacuum, and so periodically you would notice that the vacuum gauge was down below the bottom of the green, and you would ask your mechanic to adjust the vacuum regulator to bring it back up into the green and eventually it would get down below the bottom of the green and the mechanic would say we don't have any more adjustment left and that's when you knew you had to send the the pump in to be uh, to be overhauled um, that's a nice failure mode to have it it, it, uh, it is a, it's a very graceful failure when we went to these dry air pumps starting in about 1970 the failure mode went from graceful to almost intractable because uh, these dry air pumps, which don't don't require any oil for lubrication and were a lot cheaper and lighter than the old wet pumps, um, have a horrible failure mode. They they run uh, absolutely flawlessly until all of a sudden they quit and they quit um, when a little piece of, of graphite from one of the uh, veins chips off and gets jammed in the wrong place and the pump 
suddenly uh, the, it, it fractures veins and fractures the hub and the little plastic coupling that is used to uh, it's a frangible coupling used uh, in, in, in the drive shears to protect the, uh, the engine's uh, uh, accessory gears and so basically the pump runs absolutely flawlessly until all of a sudden it quits and it's completely unpredictable when it's going to quit. We've seen these things fail after 15 hours and we've seen them go over a thousand hours and um, there is no way to predict when they're going to fail. They, they give no advanced warning signs, it's just all of a sudden poof, they're gone in a, in a cloud of graphite dust. So this is a very unforgiving failure mode, uh, kind of the worst sort of thing. Um, so if you use, uh, if you have a vacuum driven gyros and you fly IFR, you really need some sort of a backup because you can never tell when one of these vacuum pumps is going to quit on you with absolutely no warning whatsoever. Um, so there are various approaches to, to getting redundancy in, in, with pneumatically driven gyros. You can either have two engine driven vacuum pumps, the, 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 the newer Cessnas that are being built uh, in Independence, Kansas are all equipped with, uh, with dual engine driven vacuum pumps. Uh, you can use a standby vacuum pump that's driven by an electric motor and a lot of, uh, a lot of legacy airplanes have been retrofitted with a standby, um, uh, a standby vacuum pump that's driven by an electric motor. So if the main pump quits, you flip a switch and the motor drives a backup pump to provide a, a vacuum. Or you can get redundancy as by having a, a second uh, uh, attitude gyro that, that is driven by electricity rather than, uh, rather than by, uh, by air. Uh, but you have to have some backup in order to make sure that if your primary vacuum pump quits, uh, which it will do without warning, um, that you have some way of keeping the dirty side down when you're flying in the clack. Um, but here's the thing: uh, if you if if you have a uh, uh, one of these standby pumps that where you flip on a switch and and a motor drives the, the standby pump, um, how sure are you that will, it will work when you need it? How often do you test it? What I find is that most pilots never turn the switch on uh, and th the standby system is almost never tested at annual inspection because it's not on any of the annual inspection checklists. So airplanes with these backup uh, standby vacuum systems will fly around for years without anybody ever flipping on the switch to, to, to verify that the system actually works. So then if you're, if you're flying IFR and you have a, your primary pump fails, you could flip on the switch and the system wouldn't work and you'd be in a world of hurt. So, so it's very important, and this isn't just with, with the standby vacuum pumps, but any, any uh, uh, system where you have a primary and then a backup, that you test the backup um, on a regular basis. Um, if, if I had a system like this in my airplane, um, I would before every flight into actual IFR, before I started the engine, I would flip on the switch and make sure that this system was capable of generating vacuum and erecting the attitude gyro so I would know that the thing was going to work if I needed it. But very few pilots do that and, uh, and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a real crapshoot when you, when you have a system like this whether it's going to work for, for you. Uh, a very similar um, situation occurs in uh, in twin Cessnas. We manage quite a few of those uh, that are that were built uh, in 1973 or earlier, where they had um, um, uh, dual alternators, as all twins do, one, one uh, driven by each engine. Uh, but the but both alternators were controlled by a single regulator and a single overvoltage relay so that if the regulator failed or the overvoltage relay tripped it would take out uh, both alternators. So to provide redundancy um, Cessna set the system up like this. It's a little bit complicated but you've got a, a main 
regulator and overvoltage relay. You've got a standby regulator and overvoltage relay. And then you have a selector switch where the pilot can uh, decide whether to um, uh, hook the, 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 the main uh, regulator and overvoltage relay to the system or the, ba or the standby one. Um, but here's the thing about and and so and that's a perfectly good system. Uh, but here, it, but here's the thing: um, the switch that the pilot uses to select between the main and the backup is a red guarded switch. Uh, to to switch to the standby regulator, you have to lift the red guard and switch the switch to standby. So the the whole um, ar switching arrangement discourages pilots from ever using the standby regulator except in an emergency. That's kind of what a red guarded switch is trying to tell you that you know this is like a like a a fire alarm you know break glass to uh, to activate the the standby regulator and the POH uh, also discourages it, uh, pilots from, from selecting the standby. It says for normal operations, the regulator select switch should be left in main. And then it says, you know, if something bad happens, then you can uh, then you can lift the red guard and switch to standby. But the message of the switch and the message in the POH both say leave the thing in main except in emergencies. Well, so what does that do? That that means that pilots of these airplanes will fly for literally decades without ever selecting the standby regulator and they don't have a clue as to whether the regulator works or not uh, until they have an emergency and 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 need it to work um, th this is uh, you know very bad uh, redundancy philosophy if you have uh, a standby unit you need to test it on a regular basis uh, otherwise, you aren't sure that it's going to work when you need it. So, um, basically, just to to uh, review some of the takeaways of the, from, from from what we've been discussing here. Uh, first of all, um, when you have a failure of a component uh, in a redundant system, you need to know how to disable a malfunctioning component and enable the backup. Uh, you know, in the case of the ignition uh, failures with the distributor gears, it, it, it is as simple as as uh, as turning the ignition switch to the correct position. But pilots aren't being trained to, to do that, and so they're they're turning what should be a fairly benign failure in a redundant system into an emergency. Uh, this is a training problem. Um, also, in order to really have the benefit of redundancy, we need to try to eliminate common mode failures. The the uh, the Bendix uh, uh, dual mag, for example, or the pressurized mags with with a, with a single uh, pressurization line and a single pressurization filter, are examples of systems that are intended to be redundant, but were designed uh, in a way that 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 caused common mode failures that can take out you know both of the components at once which is is not a very good thing and finally if we have a a primary and a backup of anything we need to make sure that we test the backup on a regular basis and make sure it actually works otherwise uh, when the primary actually fails and we need the backup it we're not sure that it's going to be there so that's pretty much what I what I wanted to to bring up tonight, Tim. Um, and we can uh, we can open up for questions just very quickly. Um, the the upcoming webinars uh, that I'm doing for the remainder of the year they're always the first Wednesday of uh, of every month. Um, in September, uh, I'm going to be doing uh, a, a webinar based on a talk that I gave at AirVenture this year for the first time. Uh, talking about maintenance philosophy, a minimalist and maximalist maintenance philosophy, and um, uh, going through a bunch of war stories and stuff. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, in October, we're going to be talking about flying efficiently in a world of $7 avgas. And we'll talk about uh, this isn't really a maintenance subject, but but how to manage power plants to, uh, to, to maximize uh, fuel efficiency. Um, in, in November, 
uh, it's a trust but verify uh, is the is the title of the webinar we're going to be talking about the importance of verifying a diagnosis uh, before uh, in, uh, authorizing a mechanic to start taking something apart and finally in December we're going to be talking about TBOs and other maintenance intervals um, so I would invite all of you to uh, to participate in 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 any of those uh, and with that Tim let me uh, let me just throw it open for uh, for Q&A great thank you Mike um, interesting presentation for sure um, one question here uh, hoping that you could turn back to the slide with three points on it John said he missed it uh, the takeaways from your presentation oh. let me do that Good. Okay. Maybe just leave that up. I'll leave that bit. up for a little bit, and then I'll go back to the uh, last slide so that people have an email address and stuff to copy down. Awesome. Craig is wondering, how do you feel about using electronic ignitions from two different manufacturers to reduce the likelihood of two identical failures at the same time, e.g. using a PMAG on the left and an electro air on the right? Well, um, First of all, let me say that 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 uh, that question is a little bit above my pay grade because all my experiences with uh, with certificated uh, uh, engines. So we haven't. Uh, I don't have any experience with PMAGs. The Electroair mag is an interesting um, an interesting uh, question because Electroair has uh, has gotten an STC uh, for four cylinder engines and is uh, working on an STC for six cylinder engines. And we we had uh, quite a bit of discussion at at, uh, at Air Venture, and and actually I spent some time talking uh, about this subject with Jimmy Tubbs, who's the uh, the uh, VP Engineering uh, and a very very smart engine guy at uh, at ECI um, Engine Components International um, about the this whole concept uh, of of a system like the Electro Air that replaces one mechanical mag, um, but leaves the other one, uh, the the other ignition system, as as a conventional mag. Um, and I have some misgivings about those systems, um, but they're based more on gut feeling than data. And uh, I, I talked to to Jimmy that that we need to gather some data, and he's actually in the process of of doing a bunch of testing of these things. My concern about these systems is that the electronic ignition systems have variable timing which which is a good thing uh, they they typically advance the timing significantly when the engine is in cruise configuration and re and retard it at, at high power settings like takeoff uh, to provide adequate detonation margin and that's all a great thing but with one electronic uh, ignition system like the electroware and the other system being a conventional mag, that means that in cruise the 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 two sparks, the two spark plugs are firing at different times, rather than be firing together, uh, as, as they do in a, in a normally configured engine with with uh, with fixed time magnetos, um, and the effect of this split timing has not really been well investigated. My concern is. First of all, that when you have split timing, where one of the mags, the one that's connected to the electronic system, fires much earlier than the other. Uh, I mean, I, I meant to say spark plugs. When when one spark plug fires much earlier than the other spark plug, instead of having two flame fronts that 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 burn towards one another and meet in the middle of the combustion chamber, you have a much more asymmetrical situation because one spark plug is firing earlier and its flame front will will be the the dominant uh, player this is going to slow down the uh, the combustion process and 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 make the the dynamics of what's going on in the combustion chamber much more asymmetrical than it otherwise would be and i don't think anybody's really studied the effects on this the the other concern i have is that if these things are installed with a normal ignition harness, then the electronic ignition system will fire 
the top spark plugs on one bank of cylinders and the bottom spark plugs on another bank of cylinders and because the top and bottom spark plugs are are, are asymmetrically located with respect to the uh, to the exhaust valve uh, again w we're introducing an asymmetry between the left bank of cylinders and the right bank of cylinders that isn't present when both spark plugs fire at the same time so there's the concern that the the that split timing will introduce um, vibration um, and uh, uh, Jimmy uh, Tubbs at ECI is in the process of doing a bunch of testing uh, with with uh, with that system on uh, one of the ECI uh, four-cylinder kind of like homing look-alikes ECI is now building certificated engines that that are based on the like homing design but but you know, different in certain respects, but he's doing a bunch of testing with these things, and hopefully, in a few months, we'll have some good data uh, on what the effect of of having uh, uh, one electronic ignition coupled with one conventional magneto, uh, uh, how that's working with respect to to vibration and with respect to uh, uh, to combustion efficiency and so on. Um, this is sort of a new thing that has only really been introduced into the uh, into the uh, certificated engine world quite recently. Uh, although I know all sorts of these ignition systems have been flying on experimental airplanes for quite a long time, but we 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 never gotten really good data uh, on these things. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with Jimmy to try to find out exactly. Um, how these things work and whether there are any downsides of of of, uh, of this thing. The, the reason that Electroair and other manufacturers are only replacing one mag instead of both uh, is because the, the FAA makes it extremely difficult uh, to get a system certified, an electronic ignition system certified um, as the sole. Uh, ignition means of ignition on a certificated engine. Um, the, you know, it has been done. The the, uh, the Aerosance system that that Continental Motors has it, is a total ignition system that's been certified, but it's extremely complicated and extremely expensive. Um, and it would be very hard for a small company like Electroware to uh, to get a uh, an ignition system that replaced both mags certified so they 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 went an easier route uh, and and got the got it certified for replacement of just one out of the two mags so we're 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 still not I'm not really sure how I feel about it I have some misgivings about it but I'm really looking forward to getting some good data on it um I think I went beyond <laughs> answering the question there but but it was a subject that was that that came up a lot at Air Venture, and there were a lot of people with questions, and w we don't really have good answers yet, but but hopefully we will before too long. Interesting, learning uh, learning more, and uh, interested in uh, hearing more about that as you as you hear more um, more questions here. We got a couple similar ones. I'll ask both of them. Uh, Steve's wondering why does the EGT rise when the spark plug fails? And then also there's a question, um, why does EGT rise when one mag fails? <laughs> well, but both of those are really the same question, of course. And uh, that was a question I was only asked about 50 times at AirVenture this year. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's an obvious question. And, and the reason is actually very simple when you think about it. Um, in a normally functioning aircraft cylinder, with both with two spark plugs that that are firing essentially simultaneously, um, each spark plug um, uh, nucleates a, a a flame front, and you wind up having two flame fronts uh, originating from two different po po uh, sides of the cylinder, uh, burning towards one another and meeting in the middle. Uh, so that's the normal. The, the normal kind of, of of combustion situation that we have in a cylinder that's functioning normally with both spark plugs firing. When one spark plug doesn't fire, then we only have a single flame front, 
that has to burn all the way across the combustion chamber rather than two flame fronts that, that are meeting in the middle. As a result, uh, when, when you only have one spark plug firing, uh, it takes longer for the combustion event to play out. And uh, because it, it progresses more slowly, at the time the exhaust valve opens um, and exhaust gas starts to come out of the cylinder, uh, out of the exhaust port and go past the EGT probe, it, it's hotter uh, because the, it hasn't had as much time to cool uh, as it would when uh, when both plugs were, were firing. The, the slower the, the combustion event progresses, the hotter it's going to be at the time the exhaust valve opens. And it's, it's the, heat, the temperature of the gas when the exhaust valve opens that the EGT probe sees. During the, the, the most of the combustion event, the, the exhaust valve is closed and the EGT probe isn't seeing anything. So what EGT is measuring is the temperature of the gas at the time that the exhaust valve opens. And the slower the combustion event, the, the, uh, the higher that temperature. In, in effect, it's almost as if you retarded the ignition timing and, and so that everything happened later uh, than it would normally happen. But that's, that's the reason, hopefully that's understandable, that's the reason that EGT rises when you go from do two spark plugs firing to only one spark plug firing. Great. Okay, Paul uh, asks, my PA46 Mirage only measures CHT and does not measure EGT. Should I try to find a way to measure EGT? Well, I'm sort of astonished by that. I, I don't know what instrumentation he has in, in his Mirage, um, but uh, uh, but virtually all engine monitors that I'm familiar with instrument both EGT and CHT, so I'd be very curious uh, uh, what, um, uh, what, what equipment he has installed for, 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 uh, for monitoring that in the Mirage. Um, the, it, I, I had a, a whole hour and a quarter session on the subject of engine monitors at uh, at AirVenture, and, and I also did a, a whole webinar on that subject that's on the EAA video server. But basically, in my view, a CHT is probably the most important of the two, and, and it's the thing we primarily look at um, uh, during normal engine operation to protect the engine from, from being overstressed. We, we keep cylinder head temperatures uh, below 400 degrees or preferably below 380. Um, EGT is primary, primarily a value um, not for power plant management for, but for detecting and uh, troubleshooting engine problems. Uh, and, you know, the, and a fouled spark plug is, is a perfect example. With a fouled spark plug you will immediately be able to detect it due to an EGT rise whereas you wouldn't be able to detect it using CHT. Um, the effect on CHT of a fouled spark plug is, is very subtle. The, the CHT will decline just a little bit, but you probably never notice it. But the EGT pops up very significantly, and, and, uh, and you know that you've had an ignition problem in that particular cylinder, and you can tell exactly which spark plug it is. And, um, so EGT is extremely handy for detecting problems and troubleshooting problems. And so I guess the short answer is uh, that if you don't have EGT instrumentation in, in, in an airplane like the Mirage, you certainly need to, uh, need to, get, to get some in. Um, it, will, it would pay for itself very quickly um, in, 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 in simplifying troubleshooting and you know, preventing uh, mechanics from having to do exploratory surgery on the engine. Uh, it's extremely useful for, for diagnosing uh, and pinpointing engine problems. And so I would certainly, uh, I'm surprised that the airplane doesn't have EGT instrumentation. I'd be real interested in what equipment is installed. Um, but I, uh, uh, I would strongly recommend uh, adding an engine monitor that, that uh, that tracks both CHT and EGT. And if you want to 
if you want to drop me an email, why don't I put the email back up? I've had the takeaways up long enough. Uh, if you want to drop me an email, I'd be happy to continue the conversation with you. I'd be really interested in knowing what sort of instrumentation you have in that Mirage that, that, that does not uh, instrument EGTs. James says, uh, I fly a 172. If I have a bad magneto, how long before I switch the bad magneto will the engine run smooth? A few seconds, a few minutes? How long do I need to wait? I, uh, Tim, I, I honestly do not understand the question. Um, He's wondering if he has a, a bad magneto. And a well, I mean, as we as we talked about, Tim, the, I mean, there are different kinds of magneto failures. If the magneto quits, the the engine isn't going to go r run rough. It's going to run just as if you had switched it to to one mag. If he has uh, a distributor gear failure of the kind that 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 I pictured, um, the engine's going to go completely berserk. He's not going to he's not going to be waiting. He's going to be panicking. And uh, you know, the the key is uh, to recognize that this is a, a magneto failure that is causing um, spark plugs to fire at inappropriate times, and to to figure out which mag it is and shut that mag off. Um, but there certainly isn't any waiting. If, if if a distributor gear fails, the engine is going to get very unhappy very fast, and it's really quite a quite a scary thing because the engine it gets very very rough. I, I don't know if I answered the okay. question because I'm not sure I totally understood the question. Okay, uh, Jonathan's wondering: uh, Does rotating the prop backwards damage or accentuate wear in dry vacuum pumps? Um, there's this is something that that I've been reading about for years. Uh, uh, I have never seen a problem. I mean, I've been dealing with dry vacuum pumps for decades. Um, I regularly turn my prop backwards. I've never seen a problem that it caused. There's a theoretical. Uh, the, the pumps are are designed. Uh, most of the pumps are designed to operate in a particular direction. Uh, the blades are canted in a particular direction. Um, if you were turning the pump rapidly in the backward direction, it might harm it. But I, frankly, if we're talking about just turning the prop backward by hand, I've done that for years and years and years and never never seen a problem. So uh, I'm inclined to believe that the that that the issue is 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 really Overblown. Um, I, I've I've just never seen uh, seen a pump failure caused by turning the prop backward. Okay, Joseph is wondering if there's any truth to the rumor that wet pumps are no longer used mostly due to litigation concerns. No, I don't think that's true. In fact, um, uh, the the original manufacturers of the of the wet pumps. Uh, like Garwin and so on are long out of business. They, they they have made new wet pumps for ages, and for a long time, airplanes with wet pumps just simply had to keep overhauling their existing pumps. There was no source of new pumps. But Airwolf, uh, the the same guys that make the remote oil filters and the and the oil separators, started manufacturing new wet pumps a few years ago, and they're they're available right now. Uh, um, if you go to uh, Airwolf Filter Corp, that they 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 manufacture brand new uh, wet pumps. So I no, I don't think there's any indication of thing there. The the litigation that I'm aware of, uh, has to do with with dry pumps, and uh, uh, basically the the dry pump was introduced by Airborne, the uh, uh, Airborne uh, division of of I think Parker Hannifin Corp. And uh, uh, after a, a very high-profile accident involving the, uh, the the governor of Missouri, um, where uh, Airborne was was sued, uh, they decided to drop out of the business, and they they just ceased making uh, vac uh, dry vacuum pumps. And uh, a couple of other companies stepped up to the plate, Rapco and and. Uh, uh, Tempest both make new vacuum pumps, um, 
so the the departure of airborne from the dry pump business was definitely litigation driven and interestingly enough the NTSB report on that Missouri uh, crash it involved a I think a Cessna 335 um, uh, exonerated the pump but uh, but airborne um, was sued anyway and and wound up settling the case for a whole lot of money many many millions of dollars and uh, they they just decided it wasn't worth it anymore and they dropped out of the out of the dry vacuum pump business that they had originated several decades earlier uh, but dry pumps are, are made by a couple of other companies now and and there's no no shortage of them okay William um, asks for a system with dual electric ignition do you feel dual alternators are sufficient backup or should uh, you also have full redundancy with two batteries this oh, assumes that the backup yeah. alternator is sized to meet needed power requirements right well you know certainly um, in a certificated installation um, there there has to be fully redundant uh, uh, electrical sources um, that that don't depend on the engine running and uh, uh, most of the all electric airplanes now um, are, have both dual alternators and dual batteries and and dual buses that are uh, diode isolated and so on so that uh, that that no single point failure can uh, can wipe out the electrical system. I assume that the question is being asked in the context of an experimental airplane um, because uh, dual electronic ignition systems are, are not really ready for prime time as far as FA certification is concerned. Um, you know the the problem that I see with with dual alternators and a single battery is you, you need to be able to restart the engine if it quits and uh, if if the if the engine quits um, you're pretty much relying solely on the battery uh, so you know if it were me I, I would certainly design the system with the uh, with dual batteries or some sort of backup source I mean um, uh, I, I know uh, th there have been cases, for example, the uh, the DA42 uh, uh, twin that that has a diesel engine and a FADEC. That they they had a they had a case where um, where they had a double engine flame out due to the lack of electricity. Uh, the FADEC required electricity, and it disappeared, and both engines shut down, which is not a good thing to have happen in a twin. And they actually solved the problem by creating a backup, uh, an emergency uh, electrical supply consisting, I think, of, of four D alkaline batteries. You know, but and it may be that simple to provide a, a a backup electrical system, but there has to be some way with if the engines if the engine is not running uh, to get it started again and. Uh, if you're depending only on a single battery, I think there's there's a risk there. Okay, William uh, says some older Cessnas have one air vent to service both gas tanks. Is this a problem? And are there STCs to add another event? A lot of Cessnas have a have a single uh, underwing vent, but by regulation, actually by AD. Uh, any Cessna that has a single underwing vent has to have vented gas caps that provide a, a, a secondary vent. Um, th this has been a problem. The, 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 the single underwing vent is theoretically non-icing because it sort of hides behind the lift strut, but there have been enough incidents where that vent plugged up for some reason, mud daubers or whatever, uh, that the FAA actually requires, uh, and there's an AD that was published on this a long time ago, uh, that, that Cessnas with a single vent have to have caps, gas caps that have, uh, that, that, that have a, uh, a secondary vent in them so that if the primary vent uh, clogs, the tanks won't collapse. So I, I think that problem has been solved a long time ago. 
Okay, Mark uh, asks, how often do you see a dry pressure pump shed particles that get past the filters and infect the attitude gyro? Um, it's, uh, it's fairly common to see that in single engine airplanes. Uh, it typically doesn't happen in twins or in singles that have dual vacuum pumps because the, uh, uh, the check valves in those systems don't permit the particles to, to, to get into the, uh, into the gyros. But in singles, uh, after a vacuum pump failure, it's very common for the, the, the particles to contaminate the hoses that, that, that go to the gyros. It's fairly common for those particles to contaminate the uh, the, the vacuum uh, relief valve that regulates the pressure and sometimes uh, the particles will migrate all the way into the uh, into the gyros. There are available some inline low loss filters that can be inserted in that vacuum line uh, to protect the gyros in case of a, of a pump failure. Um, they aren't typically installed um, as original equipment with the one exception I think Mooney started installing them in their airplanes at some point as original equipment but they can be retrofitted into almost any system to to protect the gyros um, so if you if you have a you know a single engine airplane with a single vacuum pump it would probably be worth considering uh, installing one of these uh, one of these low loss inline filters to protect the uh, the gyros against uh, carbon backing up into the gyros in the event of a pump failure. Okay. Alex uh, is wondering, what are your thoughts about leaving a battery minder on constantly? He says, my mechanic suggested using a timer and have it turn on for an hour each day versus the manufacturer recommendation to leave it on all the time. Well, the battery minder is specifically designed to be left on all the time. Um, it's got a bunch of circuitry to protect the battery from being overcharged. It's got a, uh, a temperature sensor that you mount to the battery to that where that will cause the charger to shut down if there's a battery overheat. So um, I mean, we have tons of clients that use the battery, uh, the battery minder, and run it all the time, and I've never seen a problem with it. So I, you know, that's that's how it's designed to be used and and uh, and I've never seen uh, any issues caused by leaving it on full time. Okay, Donnie makes a, a comment here. He says a note about standby electric motors. The longer an electric motor goes without being operated, the less likely it will work. Occasionally operating an electric motor helps reduce the corrosion buildup on the brushes. Absolutely and in, in fact that comment uh, applies not only to electric motors but to lots and lots of things in our airplanes. They don't like to sit. They like to be used and uh, um, so I, I agree 100 percent with that comment. Ronnie says, uh, why are the gear teeth and other parts made of plastic if they have a tendency to break from vibrations? Very easy. Um, they're inside a magneto. Uh, they're, they've got 30,000 volts uh, um, being generated in there. They have to be made of something non-conductive. They can't be made of metal. OK. Uh, Matt says, uh, just so I know, if the alternator quits in my 2000 A36, I should turn on the backup alternator and switch to standby from primary on the circuit? Question mark. Just trying to understand the circuitry here. Um, that sounds like a switchology question on, on, on the Bonanza, and I, I don't know the answer right off the the bat I would have to look it up I believe that the the newer bonanzas that come with a with a, a backup alternator uh, come with a, a BNC uh, uh, an alternator from BNC specialty products and I'd, I'd actually have to 
look up the schematic on the website to understand how the switches on that system work. I can't, uh, I can't answer the question off the top of my head, but if he will drop me an email, I will research it for him and give him an answer. Great. William asks, what is your view to having a backup altimeter open to cabin pressure? Um, well, I mean, the, the normal way of, I've got a backup altimeter in my airplane, but, but it, it's connected to the static system, and the static system has an alternate air valve so that if there's a problem with, with the static ports, I can, I can turn the valve and, and reference the entire system uh, to cabin pressure. But uh, when the altimeters are referenced to cabin pressure, they typically uh, read uh, a lower altitude than they should um, because the cabin uh, is uh, typically at higher pressure than outside ambient. Um, and considerably higher cabin pressure and uh, if you ever want to prove that if, if, if you're flying an airplane with a with a storm window and you're flying along at 150 knots you open the storm window and it doesn't want to open because there's a lot higher pressure inside the cabin than there is outside. So the general way of dealing with that is not to reference the backup altimeter to uh, to cabin pressure, but to to reference all the altimeters to the static system, and then include a an alternate static source valve in in the cockpit that you can flip that will open up the system to to the cabin in the event that the static system fails. That's the normal way of of, of constructing that. Okay, Chris says, uh, I have a Cherokee with the Electra Air STC. And he asks, um, are you suggesting I should switch to the, uh, the EI, I, I assume the electronic, uh, in cruise? He may be referring to the, uh, the, the firing difference between the electronic and the magnetic. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not actually suggesting anything. I, I'm, I certainly would, you, know, you certainly should run you should run and cruise with the mag mags on both, because. But what I am suggesting, and I'm, uh, it's, it's not based on data; it's based on a concern, and that's why I'm hoping that we can get some data on it. That having the two spark plugs firing at different times in cruise is uh, is uh, maybe may, may create some issues. Um, um, but we don't know that yet, and and I I certainly wouldn't recommend doing anything based on my my gut uncomfortableness with the system uh, we really need to have some hard data so uh, I'm going to be working with Jimmy and hopefully we'll, we'll we'll have some good test data on that system with some real good test cell runs that are well instrumented in terms of vibration and so on and you know at, at such time as I have some good information on that I, I will Definitely disseminate it. I'll probably, you know, write it up for Sport Aviation and so on, so that uh, the word gets out. But at the moment, we really don't have enough data to act on, and so no, I'm not suggesting you you, you do anything uh, other than what the POH says at the moment. All right, and a question about uh, slick or Bendix magnetos. Uh, just wondering if you can talk about a little bit of the difference and if there's a, a reliability concern with either of them or not. Well, you know, I, I have an opinion on that. Um, uh, you know, just based on experience with all of them, the there, there are basically three families of magnetos available today. The, there's the the slick 6000 series. Uh, there's the the Bendix S20, S200 series, which is the smaller Bendix mag, and then there's the Bendix S1200, which is the big Bendix mag. Um, of the three, the S1200 is by far the best mag. It is much more robust. It generates a much hotter spark. Uh, it, it's it's far and away the best available magneto. The problem with the S1200 is it's physically quite large, and uh, it doesn't fit uh, every engine installation. Uh, I have S1200s on 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 my airplane. Um, uh, they're they're wonderful mags. They're reliable. They work up at, at up in the low flight levels without pressurization because they're so large. 
uh, and they they fire a very very hot spark, which which overcomes lots of uh, lots of other problems like spark plugs and so on. Uh, so they are by, by far my favorite mag. The problem is they don't fit uh, in in every installation because there's just not enough room to install them. Um, my company manages a, a large number of Cirruses, for example. Uh, the Cirruses all use uh, Bendix S20 mags because the S1200s uh, won't fit. They won't even come close to fitting. In fact, there's, there's just barely enough space there for the uh, for the uh, Bendix S20s. Uh, personally, I would rate the the slicks as uh, at the bottom of of my list. I don't particularly like them. Um, they have a, a history of of problems. They're very s physically small, which uh, can be a problem up at up at higher altitudes. Um, the Bendix S20 is sort of in the middle. Uh, compared to the slicks, I would pick the Bendix S20s, but the S1200s, which are the big, big heavy tractor mags, are far and away the best mags available if you have an installation where they'll fit. They fit uh, almost all of the Continental engines that 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 use a bottom induction system. They won't fit the Continentals with a top induction system because the top induction system just gets in the way and doesn't provide enough room for, for the mags. And whether they fit a Lycoming installation really depends on how much room you have between the engine and the firewall and whether there's enough room to accommodate a mag as large as the S1200. Great. Uh, David asks, regarding dual vacuum sources, what is your evaluation of the precise flight system? It says he typically flies five to 9,000 feet in the yeah, Midwest. The, the precise flight system uh, is, is a standby vacuum system that instead of having a, a backup vacuum pump, uh, basically just taps into the, the induction manifold uh, and uses the vacuum in, in the uh, in the in the air in the uh, en engine's uh, induction manifold as an alternate vacuum source. Um, first of all, the precise flight system only will work on a normally aspirated airplane. It will not work on turbocharged ones. And second of all, I'm not all that crazy about the precise flight system because it depends on on um, the induction system vacuum, and so it only powers the gyro if the engine is at part throttle. Uh, when you go, if if you have to apply full power, um, the the induction system no longer has has a, any significant vacuum in it, and so you lose your your power source. That concerns me. Because if the primary pump were to fail and you were to, you know, shoot an instrument approach and have to go mist, uh, as, as you're going mist and you go to you go to full power to to uh, to to, uh, to climb, uh, you know, your attitude gyro is is going to start rolling over on you. So I'm not crazy about the system. It is inexpensive. It does provide some backup. Um, it's certainly better than nothing only works on normally aspirated airplanes and you have to understand that that it will it will stop providing vacuum to the instruments uh, if if you go to full throttle so that's a limitation on it that 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 the pilot has to be very very conscious of if he's using that using the backup system okay uh let's see Jerome is saying in the Bendix D2000 and D3000 dual mags with the single impulse coupling, if the impulse coupling fails, doesn't this only affect engine starting? If the engine is already running and the impulse coupling fails, won't uh, won't the engine continue to run? Well, I mean, it depends on the kind of failure that we're talking about, and and he is correct that most impulse coupling failures involve the the the, the pawls and the springs and would only affect. Uh, starting, um, but you know if there's if there's a failure, for example, of the woodruff key or something, um, uh, or if the uh, you know the nut securing the 
impulse coupling uh, hasn't been torqued correctly and starts coming loose, you, you, you run the risk of of the entire dual mag failing. It doesn't happen very often. Actually, the the common mode failure we see most often, as as I indicated, is is the is the mag clamps coming loose and the mag starting to to rotate and and uh, and its timing getting screwed up as a result. And uh, in the dual mag, that affects both mags. That's that's by far the m more common failure that we see. Um, impulse coupling failures are, don't happen that frequently. I, I mentioned the impulse coupling only, you know, for completeness because there are there are two common mode failures, but it's the it's the the loosening of the clamps that we see most often as a problem with those mags. Okay. Dan is wondering, do you recommend replacing the slick mags every 500 hours rather than servicing them? Um, well, you know, slick used to have a program back when, when Unison owned them where they offered uh, factory rebuilt slick mags at a very attractive price and it almost economically made more sense to just trade the mags in every 500 hours on a rebuild and we recommended that to clients for years but uh, Unison got out of the business they sold uh, the slick mag product line to Champion and Champion killed the rebuild program there is no such thing as 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 uh, as rebuilt uh, uh, slick mags anymore um, so if you if you trade them in, you, you've got to trade them in on new mags, and they're much more expensive. And and so that sort of changed the game. And now we we tend to to send the slicks out uh, for 500 hour IRANs, just like we always did with Bendix mags. Uh, it's it's really a shame because that that slick uh, rebuilt mag program was really a great one. Um, but uh, like I said, when when the slick mags were sold. Uh, to champion when Unison got out of the business, uh, that program uh, was a casualty of the of the sale. Uh, champion decided not to offer rebuilt uh, slick mags anymore. Okay, Larry's wondering uh, which are more reliable, electric uh, artificial horizon or uh, vacuum? Electric by a very wide margin. They're much much more reliable. They're also a lot more expensive. Um, but there's absolutely no comparison. Uh, the, the electric gyros are much more reliable. They run much, much longer without requiring overhauls. Um, uh, big, big, big difference. Okay. What are your thoughts on dynamic propeller balancing? Um, my thoughts are that, that dynamic balancing is a very good idea. Um, uh, to be honest with you, how much benefit you will get from a dynamic balance uh, depends on how you know how far out of balance your prop is to begin with, and most of us won't know that until we we do a dynamic balance. But uh, but but I've had my props dynamically balanced, and and we 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 recommend uh, dynamic balancing to to our manage maintenance clients. It's it's not very expensive. Um, it's a it's a really good thing to do, uh, and we typically recommend uh, uh, doing it again. Ever you know if there's if there's an engine change or any any kind of work done on the propeller or anything that could possibly change the uh, uh, change the balance of the system, it's it it's it's a it's a good idea and it, and we recommend doing it. Okay, H is wondering uh, if there's any coolers for dry vacuum pumps. Well, there there are shrouds um, uh, that go over uh, the vacuum pumps that can be plumbed to a to a blast tube, and and that's done fairly often to keep the pumps cool. Um, I personally haven't really seen a big benefit from using them, but a lot of people do do use them. Um, the the pumps really shouldn't run hot if they're uh, if if the uh, the vacuum system in general is in good shape, but um, uh, the cooling shrouds probably would be of benefit in aircraft where the vacuum pump is mounted in a hot 
place and and uh, um, doesn't doesn't get much significant cooling air just from from the ambient surroundings where the pump is mounted. But yeah, the, there there are uh, uh, typically uh, stamped plastic shrouds that kind of snap over the outside of a vacuum pump and are connected to a uh, a piece of flexible air duct that's mounted to a hole in the baffle so that that uh, that high pressure air uh, uh, is uh, cools the pump and goes through the pump vanes and I've seen a lot of uh, installations where those shrouds are used. Okay, Dennis is wondering about uh, your thoughts on using the um, the iPad as a as a backup for um, attitude uh, information. Uh, he said some of them can be hooked up to a portable AHARS unit. Yeah, I you know I don't actually have experience using the iPad uh, in that in that configuration. But I have run some tests um, with with just normal portable GPSs like a, like a Garmin 696 or or, uh, or 496 uh, that have a, a screen that you can punch up that that sort of simulates uh, uh, an instrument panel. And um, a couple of times when I've been when I've given uh, instrument students an instrument proficiency check and they're flying under the hood. Uh, just sort of for extra credit after we get done with all of the normal stuff on the instrument proficiency test check I'll ask them to I'll cover up all the all the inst all the gyro instruments and ask them to use the 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 portable GPS simulated instruments uh, and and uh, fly a few legs and fly an approach and it's it, it actually works pretty well the 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 the, the GPS derived attitude indicator um, has a little bit of lag to it so the, the 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 flying is not quite as smooth as it would be with a, with a normal attitude indicator but I, I've done this with students enough to 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 be pretty sure that uh, that you can keep the dirty side down and you can actually shoot an approach with nothing but one of these portable GPS's that, that that has a simulated instrument panel on it. So uh, in my mind, it's a very uh, it's a very important uh, uh, backup source, and uh, it's not quite as good as as a, as real instruments, but it's it it's sure it's sure a lot better than nothing. And I think the chances of being able to successfully get the airplane down in in, uh, in IMC using a portable GPS display is better than trying to do it by needle ball and airspeed the old way where, where all you where all you have is a, a turn and bank um, uh, to go by that the turn and bank flying turn and bank alone something that I do uh, quite every year when I do my simulator training is is very difficult it's it's uh, it's sort of a rapidly wasting uh, uh, capability that that unless you do it regularly, you you lose the ability to do it, and the uh, the track record is is quite bad. Uh, uh, pilots uh, uh, frequently uh, lose control of the airplane when they're reduced to nothing but a turn and bank in instrument conditions. The the the, the portable GPSs I think are much much better. Uh, than trying to do it with with just needle ball and airspeed, and I think they represent a real uh, a real benefit of safety. The the new stuff with an AHARS and an iPad would be even better than that. Uh, I just don't have any personal experience uh, flying with them. But if if you can keep the dirty side down with just a portable GPS, you certainly ought to be able to do a very good job with a with an iPad and a, and a couple to an AHARS. Awesome. Well, we're reaching the end here. We got one more question uh, from Mark, and then we've we've gotten to about the end of them here. Mark just wonders uh, if he can uh, use a dry vacuum pump for his 1967 Cessna 172 that has an O300D. Uh, he certainly can. I don't know what he has installed now, but if he has a wet pump and is thinking of changing to a dry pump I would sort of discourage him because the wet pumps I think were a lot better um, but the accessory pad on all the engines are, are 
basically the same, and and there's no t technical reason why he couldn't install a dry pump if that's what he really wants to do. Um, I, I don't totally understand the situation. Again, if he wants to drop me an email and elaborate a little bit, I'd be glad to. Uh, I'd be glad to to discuss it with him. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for this uh, informative webinar and uh, good question and answer session here. Looks like uh, next month, uh, September 4th, your webinar is, Is Your Mechanic a Minimalist or a Maximist? Yeah, that's going to be a fun one. I, I, did that, I did that at AirVenture this year for the first time. Looking forward to it next month. Mike uh, Bush, thank you so much for your time. I'm uh, to all the attendees. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Have a good night, everybody.